Hello, uh, kind people. This is a belated post-game analysis uh, of Game 1 of the World Championship match going on uh, in London right now between Magnus Carlsen and Fabiano Caruana. And uh, I'm back at my post and uh, uh, these videos probably will now be a, a daily occurrence. Uh, and uh, with that, there is a lot of game there to discuss, so let's stop talking and bring up uh, bring up the the uh, actual playing of chess. Uh, there was a lot of guesswork involved, of course, with what the opening we will see in game one, and uh, it doesn't need to be quoted necessarily, uh, but Fabiano sticks with 1e4, which is something that he has uh, been doing consistently against Magnus in most of their classical games. And Magnus plays c5, which is uh, probably not his first move uh, of choice uh, over the course of his career. I believe he is more of a 1e5 player, but he has been playing c5 reasonably consistently uh, uh, in the past uh, couple of years, among other things. So it's not a surprise as such. Fabi played knight f3, knight c6, and another topic for potentially uh, a more discussion starting from game three is uh, what exactly is Magnus planning to do if white just uh, calls his bluff and plays 3d4 here, which is uh, something which you don't really see at the top level because bishop b5 is overwhelmingly popular instead and uh, other people play knight c3. Uh, so nobody really allows you to play the Sveshnikov. But whether it's actually the Sveshnikov that Magnus is planning there is is an interesting question. But anyway, uh, bishop b5, g6, uh, bishop takes c6. And here Magnus took with the d pawn, which is uh, not very fashionable these days. There's a lot of theory involved with bc, castles, uh, bishop g7, uh, followed uh, by the plan of developing the knight to h6 and then playing f7, f5 at the earliest opportunity. But dc6 is kind of uh, old school treatment of uh, of the Rosalimo and it leads to uh, uh, a more strategic battle, so to speak. bc6 is an attempt to uh, to equalize by force, by, by just studying it very deeply and then uh, showing com concrete, uh, quite forcing variations, which uh, seem to be currently, at least, uh, to be working out quite well for black. But uh, dc6 uh, is an attempt to get a very complicated, very double-edged position and then just play, which ob obviously uh, suits Magnus's general chess style quite well. d3, bishop g7, h3, this is all uh, very, very standard. Knight f6, knight c3, knight d7, bishop b3, e5. I'm not uh, going to speak uh, too much about other other setups and other options that are available to black in these types of positions because this is what Magnus chose and as I, as I mentioned it's a it's a long game even if you uh, lop off the uh, the 50 or so moves at the end of it I'm spoiling things here a little bit uh, and uh, <clears throat> Fabi Castle short uh, in some in some similar structures, white uh, sometimes plays queen d2 and castles long, but here I think casting short is a lot more uh, natural. And Magnus played b6 here, which is not the, the most popular move. The most popular move here is queen e7, and after queen e7, queen d2, uh, I personally played a couple of interesting games in this line. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, some time ago though, but uh, I used to be a reasonably active player of the Rosalimo with white in the years when black used to take on c6 with the d-pawn. So I had this position in a game against Luke Van Veli, who allowed me to play uh, bishop h6, and uh, uh, the game continued uh, knight f8, bishop h6, f6, knight h4, knight e6, knight e2, and I was later able to push f4 and uh, win a nice game in a Bundesliga uh, years ago. And uh, uh, Gary Kasparov uh, played h6 after queen d2 in this position against me and after knight h2, knight f8. And this is a very, very typical idea for these types of positions. The knight on d7 uh, in general is aimed via the, the f8 square towards e6 and then either to d4 or perhaps to stop the, the, the push f to f4. Uh, so this is a very, very uh, topical uh, topical plan. And here I chose not to even play f4. Uh, looking at it uh, uh, today, I'm, I, I can't really understand why I didn't play f4 in this position, but I played knight e2, knight e6, a3, a knight d4, and b, b4 against uh, uh, Gary in that game. And it was also, uh, it was eventually drawn after a very sharp endgame in which I had to 
uh, I had to defend. But Magnus, as mentioned, starts with b6, which is uh, very similar, obviously. The idea is to take pressure off the, uh, the c5 pawn, uh, and, and then once again, whoops, arrows, and then once again bring the knight over to e6. Uh, but it's a more permanent solution to the, to, to the problem of the hanging c5 pawn, obviously. And uh, here interesting things uh, begin happening, because uh, the most natural move in the position, of course, is queen d2. You once again reestablish this threat of bishop h6, which is generally quite useful for black, so for white, sorry. So black will reply by playing h6, and you go knight h2 here. And uh, general consensus about this position is that you can play knight f8, and if you look at the position after f4, ef4, rook takes f4, and let's say bishop e6, you will see pretty much this position later in the game which I think explains why some of the choices that Magnus made in the game, which surprised us uh, uh, during the live coverage, uh, basically we were very surprised at how quickly he made some moves which did not at all seem obvious. Uh, it probably stemmed from the fact that uh, via this move order you can actually uh, uh, arrive uh, uh, at positions you will see later. So uh, Magnus was just uh, using that knowledge to um, transpose to something he knew quite well. But after f4, bishop takes a, uh, <coughs> after uh, f4, e4, white can also take with the bishop, which is quite promising in these types of positions. And uh, the idea, of course, is to push e4, e5, and then the knight from c3, which is kind of a useless piece right now, uh, gets those uh, wonderful potential squares on f6 and d6. So black plays knight e6, and here you can choose. Uh, complications which arise after bishop g3, queen g5, queen e1, knight d4, which seems to be quite uh, quite good for black. Or you can go back to e3, and after knight d4, uh, there were some recent games where white sort of autopiloted once again and played rook f2, rook f1, which I don't think does very much because black is uh, quite clearly planning to castle queen side. But there is a possible plan here of playing rook a e1, and even after bishop e6 reply, with uh, e4, e5, regardless, going for a much sharper play, uh, once again hoping to establish this um, uh, knight e4 idea, and after bishop takes e5, the pawn on h6 will be hanging in some variations. Uh, and the position becomes very, very sharp. But there is also, after queen d2, h6, uh, knight, f2, knight h2, there is a peculiar move g6, g5, which is something that uh, Hikaru Nakamura actually played against uh, uh, against Fabi in uh, 2015, and the game was incredibly sharp. Fabi uh, quite naturally uh, transferred the other knight to g3, uh, black knight went to g6 here, and after a3 castles, b4 takes takes, and knight h4, it became a proper dogfight. Black pushed f5, the structure is kind of broken everywhere, and it's very difficult to assess who is better. Uh, I have a feeling white probably was doing quite well for large parts of that game, but um, it's a very, very complicated struggle. And uh, not really, I couldn't really remember that game during the live show, and I was wondering why uh, Fabi is taking such a long time after b6 to make what appears to be the most national of queen d2, and he ended up not making it at all, and played knight h2. I guess because g6, g5 here looks very, very artificial. Uh, with the queen also uh, uh, more in control of the light squares, and it just doesn't feel right to play g5 here. So Magnus replied with knight f8, f4, ef, uh, bishop takes f4, and uh, 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 bishop takes f4, sorry, bishop takes f4 wasn't played, but even here, bishop takes f4 definitely makes some sense uh, trying to push for uh, the same ideas of e5 and knight f4. But uh, Fabi uh, still had his eyes set, I think, on a, the, the, the standard plan of taking with the rook. Black goes knight e6, the rook goes back, then we play queen d2, we play rook f1, and we've gained uh, a tempo because we, uh, we took with the rook from f1 and we return it to f2 here. Uh, c comparing this with uh, taking with the bishop and then after knight e6 going to e3, we obviously won a tempo by shifting the rook forward one square. But after rook takes a four, uh, knight e6 did not happen. Magnus instead played bishop e6. And here it becomes rather obvious that Magnus is aiming for a very uh, different type of a setup. The knight for the time being will stay uh, on f8, 
Now, Black Steel, of course, is uh, aiming to castle queenside, and he is also very likely uh, will be trying to push uh, his kingside play as fast as possible the moment he evacuates the king from the center. Fabi played a rook f2, uh, to which uh, Magnus replied by playing h6, and this move in particular uh, surprised us a great deal uh, during the live broadcast because it didn't feel obvious and it was played uh, very, very fast. But uh, once again, uh, uh, I remind you that after queen d2, which is arguably already slightly inaccurate, in particular with the move that Fabi made on the next move, after queen d2, uh, Magnus played g5. And this is the position we could have gotten via a different move order if Fabi started with queen d2 earlier. So uh, Magnus was quite clearly trying to transpose to something he knew. And let's go back to, back to the position after rook f2 h6 and address it. Uh, as mentioned, playing queen d2 and then doubling on the f file and then trying some kind of knight g4, knight f6 plans is the uh, kind of time honored uh, way of playing these positions. But against this particular black setup, this is a bit empty and it doesn't really do anything at all for white apart from wasting quite a lot of time. And the correct way uh, to proceed here would be to start by playing a4. Uh, allowing a5 uh, is possible, but it uh, feels slightly uh, dangerous. Black can, for instance, do something like knight d7, knight f3. And you will note that in most of these lines, the knight actually doesn't go to g4. It goes to f3 to support potential d3, d4 breaks and to better fight uh, for the central squares. Now, let's say black plays queen c7, we play queen d2, and black just castles into it, so to speak. We can play, for instance, bishop f4, knight e5, and a5. And these types of positions uh, are very, very unclear, but also incredibly playable for white. I would probably take white uh, because he will be able to create quite a lot of hassle for black on the queen side. And if a4, a5 to stop all these ideas, white can play knight f3 and then at a good moment start pushing uh, in the center, trying to stop black from establishing uh, a safe situation for himself in the center and on the queen side. For instance, after queen c7, Already here, uh, you can definitely make an argument for something like d4, castles and rook d2, trying to expose uh, black's position while the knight is still on f8 and not connected to, uh, to what is going on. And this leads to uh, very sharp positions, which uh, are definitely very playable for white. Maybe black has a quality here, but white is in no trouble. And as a matter of fact, I think including a5, a4, a5 is good. But even if you don't, and start with knight f3 here, even this arguably is stronger than what Fabi ended up doing. But queen d2 is what he chose, g5, rook f1, and here, uh, live on air, we, were, we had a lot of fun with Alexander Grishuk discussing uh, really wild positions uh, arising from uh, uh, this line where black cannot take on c3, he loses there, but he can play bishop d4, hg, and knight e5. And the computer does uh, confirm that this is very playable for black, and in fact white is not even better. But this is very, very academic, because uh, Magnus was never going to allow that. He played uh, uh, queen d6 instead. And this is uh, probably uh, the, the first very big turning point where uh, a, a, an inaccuracy uh, uh, made by Fabi here started uh, costing him quite seriously. He proceeded with what uh, is the normal plan here, which is knight g4, and uh, very soon he was faced with a position uh, that was uh, far from enjoyable and uh, had to defend very accurately, not to lose more or less on the spot. Instead of that, it was still time to switch to uh, that setup, knight f3, castles, and a4. And it looks a bit stupid to do this when the rook, which was uh, uh, on a1, uh, is now on f1. But even here, uh, it's quite playable because after something like, if, if black just pretends to completely ignore it, he's actually in quite a lot of trouble because uh, it will be quite difficult to stop the b4 break and then the black, uh, the black queen side will start collapsing. So uh, black after a4 has to choose between something like uh, knight d7, a5, and rook h8, sort of abandoning the plans of pushing uh, uh, his pawns on the, on the, on the king side. And another plus side of putting the knight on f3 is it makes uh, black's idea of playing, let's say, h5 and g4 this much harder to realize because the pawn on g5 will be uh, under uh, a lot more control. And here white can, let's say, take, take, go back to a1, king b7, and for instance, play d3, d4. 
and uh, it's a mess but it's a mess that white probably is reasonably okay with and if after a4 black plays a5 uh, if you allow the knight to land on g6 you're probably stuck with no real play but there is just enough time here to play e5 bishop e5 knight e4 queen c7 knight e5 queen e5 and here the machine suggests a very elaborate uh, elaborate maneuver of queen e1 f5 and bishop d2 creating the threat of bishop c3 and he, sing, he thinks that white has a very good compensation for the pawn but even the, the caveman approach of just uh, hacking on c5, bc5, queen a5, queen c7, check, takes, and queen a6 leads to a position where, once again, the computer says black is fine, but uh, I think it's quite clear that so is white. Uh, white has a couple of pawns for the piece here, and uh, the king on e7 is very far from safe, so there is a lot of play uh, uh, against... Uh, against the exposed king on e7. So white would be doing quite uh, quite well here. But after knight g4 castles knight f6 and knight d7, it turns out that uh, it really is very unclear where white pl white's play is coming from uh, because he hasn't really created anything on the queen side and black is uh, very ready to start something on the other side of the board. So Fabi played knight h5, bishop b5, and he made a very, very committal, but probably uh, required move here, g2, g4, because if you imagine something like b3, and black plays g4, uh, the black attack on the queen on the king side will uh, develop incredibly quickly here, and uh, white is in a tremendous amount of trouble. But after g4, uh, the situation on the king side is more or less stable, and Apart from the plan that Magnus immediately started realizing, there's really not that much that you can suggest to shift this blockade. So Magnus played f6 with obviously the idea of playing bishop f7 and eventually taking on h5 and opening up at least some files. And uh, uh, to add to, to the fact that white is objectively quite seriously worse here, uh, Fabi was quite seriously behind on the clock. He had, I believe, something like 20 minutes against maybe 50 or 45 for Magnus somewhere here, which is not an enviable situation to find yourself in. He played uh, b3, uh, bishop f7 and knight d1. Originally we thought that knight d1 uh, is connected with the idea of doing something like rook g2 and then eventually maybe playing knight f2 and knight g4 once uh, the, the, the trade on h5 happens. But in many cases, it's even more important that the white uh, preserves the square, uh, the e2 square for the queen, so that the queen can come to g4 and the queen can come to the protection of the h5 pawn. So it's a multi purpose defensive move. And Magnus uh, started thinking quite seriously here because uh, uh, it's not really clear how to proceed. If you do something uh, natural, like you can play rook g8 here, creating the idea of taking and playing g4. White re-establishes control over the g4 square. You play queen e6, <coughs> indirectly attacking the pawn on g, uh, h3. And white can even play queen, king, king g2 here, bishop h5, g h, g4, and just play h4. And this pawn on g4 serves as a very, very sufficient uh, blocker in front of the white king. It's very difficult to open any files. And now the pawn on h6 is hanging. The rook has a fantastic square on f5. White arguably is already playing for uh, uh, for uh, advantage here. Uh, therefore, Black needs some uh, some creative ways of defend, uh, developing initiative, and he went with Knight f8, just completely abandoning the f6 pawn, which is a very good decision, but also I think, in some ways, uh, influenced by the fact that Fabi was getting very short on time, and he. I think Magnus felt that uh, giving Fabi concrete problems to solve was better than just giving him um, decisions which can be made by common sense, so to speak. White took on f6, and in studio during the live broadcast we were discussing whether h5 is quite strong here, but the computer suggests that uh, a weird-looking move knight h7 just gives white uh, a serious advantage because the trades that will happen after this will actually favor white. Uh, but the move that Magnus made is also arguably not the most precise, but for a reason I think a human person uh, is uh, extremely unlikely to, to, to understand or believe if, the, if it occurs to him. Uh, he played knight e6. The machine suggests starting with bishop g6 is more precise, but once again, the machine is welcome to such suggestions, <laughs> is all I can say about it. It's not, 
it's not really very easy to make a move like this. And also the reason 96 is not very precise is just so bizarre that I think most people will just disregard it. Uh, in this position, uh, the move 97, which we mentioned uh, during the live show, I'm sure one of the three of us suggested it, and we immediately uh, went back because we thought, okay, in the bishop f4, and it forces the, the knight to go back, and we just wasted two tempi. As a matter of fact, uh, by wasting these two tempi, we lured the bishop to f4. And if black does something uh, indifferent, I don't know, bishop g6 or some move like that, white is extremely happy to go for this. And this position, uh, in some cases, will be uh, just seriously better for white. I'm not sure if this particular one is better for white, but it's definitely playable, and it's an improvement in white's fortunes. Which means that after knight d7, bishop f4, and knight f6, black is forced to either go back to e5 and allow a threefold, or play something like bishop g3, rook f3, and something, let's say, like bishop g6. But then it's, I think, reasonably obvious that white gained uh, a lot of time compared to, for instance, what we, what we will see in the game. But uh, the move that Fabi made, knight h5, is by far the most obvious move in the position. And once again, the machine suggests that you can play bishop g6, sorry, uh, here, bishop g6, uh, let's say king h1, and something like king b7 even, just strengthening your position for the time being, because the white, the white uh, setup is sturdy, but really lacking in any kind of active opportunities. And the position after queen e2 is a kind of a strange one because the machine likes it for black, but it also doesn't offer any uh, real uh, ideas on how to improve. So it's difficult to assess just how good this is. But um, Magnus's choice actually allowed white uh, immediate equality. He took on h5, gh, and played knight f4. And this is what we expected in the studio as well. But after bishop takes f4 and gf, I think Fabi had something between 10 and 8 minutes, maybe, for the remaining 15 moves. And he chose not to take on f4, and uh, our original reaction as well was that this is probably suicide, because black will find a way to somehow connect it with checks uh, to break through on the king side, and why will just get mated, because I mean, the king on g1 is very exposed, there are two open files in front of it. But the fact of the matter is, after rook h g8, king h2, let's say queen d4, uh, white can even take on h6. There are so few threats that black has that even uh, a move like this is playable. But also white can go knight e3, rook df8, and knight f5. And these positions are quite unclear, as is the endgame after queen takes f4, rook takes f4, and uh, I clicked around here a little bit. It's not very important exactly how to proceed from here, but the uh, evaluation appears to be uh, around equal uh, in most cases. Uh, but once again, it's not such an easy decision to take in, in severe time trouble, and uh, Fabi played rook g2, and after rook g2, <clears throat> uh, he, is, uh, he is in trouble, although maybe uh, the position is objectively still, uh, still defensible. Rook hg8, and uh, Fabi played queen e2. There is a very beautiful variation here that we couldn't calculate properly uh, live on air, but I want to show you because uh, the final move in that variation is very beautiful. Uh, Fabi was never going to play knight f2, but we couldn't refute it straight away uh, during the show. Uh, we obviously immediately started discussing this line f3, takes, takes, knight g4. You can take on g4 straight away even. hg, bishop d4 check, king h2, queen g3. Queen h2 seems to be the only move. Queen takes g4. But we couldn't figure out what black is threatening, because as I mentioned on air, let's say after c3, bishop e5, I said, is impossible, because white plays rook g1, and the queen is driven back. And if, in fact, if the queen is forced to go back, then white is just winning. But there is this move f3, f2 in this position, in which all three of black's attackers are currently hanging, and it is white who is getting mated. Uh, because after, let's say, rook takes g4, f1, queen, check, Queen g1, queen h3 is made, and also rook g1, queen f3 check, queen g2, queen takes h5 is made. So I wanted specifically to show you this position and to show you this f3, f2 move, which I think uh, is a very, very attractive and a very nice, uh, nice little tactic. Uh, but notably, if I does something like, let's say, rook f3, uh, queen d4, and king h1, 
Black has to start going after White's uh, queen side here, like Rook G2, Queen G2, Queen A1, and Black is much better. But I mean, this topic of uh, black switching to attacking the white queen, uh, queen side is quite important and it's, it will be relevant later. Fabi played queen e2, rook g2, queen g2, queen e6, and finally the knight from d1 uh, realizes its mission and gets to uh, this fantastic squ square on g4. But black on the other hand uh, is in time to attack and collect the pawn on h5, re-establishing the material equality and continuing the attack. But White, if he is very, very precise, probably survives this position. And Fabi started correctly by playing queen f3, queen takes h5, and king f2. Uh, if you try to keep the king in the corner by playing something like king h2, uh, king h2, there is a very important resource here, queen h4, based on the fact that white cannot take on e5 because rook g3 just wins. Uh, and then uh, black is threatening h5, of course, and after, let's say, uh, rook g1, uh, bishop d4, rook g2. A number of moves are very strong here, but even something quiet like rook g7, g8, g5, once again preparing h5, because in the current position after, uh, sorry, after rook g2, after h5, white has ideas like knight e3, and you have to calculate. Uh, but rook g5, uh, putting the rook on a protected square so that after h5, knight e3 will not be an option, uh, gives black a very, very significant advantage here. And obviously you cannot take on f4 here because uh, bishop b5, the knight is pinned and the, uh, the queen is lost. So queen f2 is the correct decision. But after bishop c7, Fabi had this one move window where he could have probably saved the game by playing e5 immediately, attacking the pawn on c6, which is very important, forcing black to spend the tempo on uh, defending it and immediately playing knight f6. This is a very diff difficult sequence to uh, to play uh, in severe time trouble because it seems like you're uh, breaking apart your own blockade. But the matter of fact is, after check and king e2, white will take on f4 next move. And the position you will get in most variations is something like this. Rook g3 takes, takes. White, for some reason, the computer in insists it's very important to play to a4 here. Probably not to lose it later. And then black does pick up the e5 pawn. But white establishes this blockade. Uh, and finally, the king will be reasonably safe somewhere around d1, c1, b1, if it runs all the way there, if black keeps the queen's on. And if the queens come off, the knight on e4 is so strong that, yes, black has a, uh, an outside passer. But it seems like white's uh, drawing chances are very, very significant here. The machine uh, doesn't even think black's advantage is worth um, uh, half a pawn here. I think the variation is something like minus 0 40, which for a position with a healthy extra pawn is uh, not a lot. But Fabi instead played king e2, uh, which is a very natural move. Once again, white is trying to run towards relative safety, uh, safety on the, of the queen side. But this move should have cost him the game. And now we're entering a very strange sequence of, uh, of moves where Magnus uh, is basically winning after queen g5 and will continue being uh, completely winning uh, on every single move until move 41. And uh, the only mistake that actually cost him his entire advantage was move 40. Uh, he had, I think, something close to two minutes to make move 40. So even that was, I, I think, quite avoidable. So all in all, uh, a tremendously uh, m massive series of misses for the world champion. And the reason this position is winning is very simple. Now white does not have time to play e5 because h5 attacks the knight, and the pawn will be lost with check. So the knight will get driven back, and then black combining threats against the white king and against the white uh, king side uh, should win very, very straightforwardly. If I played knight h2, not even waiting for black to play h5, and this is the first point in the game where uh, the move queen e5, which we basically were screaming about in the studio because we, we, we couldn't see how you don't play a move like this, more or less finishes the game because once the, line, uh, the queen lands on uh, b2, uh, the combined threats will just be way too much to handle. One possible variation is something like queen f2, queen b2, king d1, and now we include the bishop in the attack by playing b6, b5, creating those uh, threats of bishop a5 check. And if queen d2, uh, bishop a5 wins anyway, because after taking, 
a black can give a check and the rook also comes in from the other side of the board and after king e2 queen takes c2 white basically gets uh, gets mated or has to uh, uh, lose a lot of material not to get mated so uh, the game will finish very soon but magnus played h5 which is also quite understandable because uh, well you want to uh, make sure the knight never returns rook f2 and once again here uh, the move queen g7 is probably the cleanest way to win because uh, once again you land the queen on b2 and the game more or less finishes. White just cannot really deal with all the combined threats uh, the, the queen uh, incursion uh, results in. But also, uh, somewhat surprisingly to me, even the same move queen e5, which we, we, we roundly criticized during the live show, is completely winning as well. Rook g2, which is obviously why queen g7 is aesthetically cleaner. Rook takes g2, queen takes g2, queen b2. And I was shocked to see that even with the queens, uh, with the rooks off the board, uh, the computer thinks this is just uh, entirely winning for black. Because the knight on h2 is just so completely uh, dead that white will never develop any counterplay. And after, let's say, king g2, the same idea of b5, bishop a5 check just, just wins. And I guess after king f3, black can even maybe choose between some mating ideas and you know, starting to collect stuff on the queen side. And once again, the knight from h2 will take ages and ages to get anywhere, and probably objectively will not get anywhere in this game. But the move that Magnus chose is doesn't really spoil anything. He went queen g1, knight f1, another position in which the computer says uh, queen g7, and after knight g2, the computer says you can even waste the tempo on king b7, preparing uh, to come in and... Uh, Queen h5, queen c3. Uh, the machine suggests this is basically resignable once again for white. A very typical uh, typical uh, situation uh, in that sequence of moves. But Magnus decided to play h4, I guess, so that it never hangs again uh, in this game. Uh, king d2, king b7, and c3. So white is actually making some progress. You can make an argument this is progress because the, the king is about to get to c2, which is by far the most comfortable square it's been at uh, in the last number of moves. But still, the, the issues remain. The, the only open file on the board, the g file, is completely under black's control. The king, even on c2, is not entirely safe. Knight on f1 has no moves, and frankly, none of white's pieces have any, uh, any actual moves. And there is also a forced win right now for black, but I don't think... Um, uh, the, the fact that uh, Magnus did not go did not go for it is uh, that striking. Although having played h4, a lot of commentators were extremely uh, surprised that rook g3 did not follow. And we in the studio were also uh, busy trying to figure out exactly how Black wins after takes takes and rook e2. And I think uh, events in the game just moved us uh, away from this position, or we would have found it eventually. But I'm pretty sure this is why Magnus didn't play it. Rook e2 with the idea of meeting queen a1 with a5, king c1, and e6. And you get to this position where <coughs> uh, black has this, uh, you know, uh, armada of pawns everywhere. But this pawn in e6 appears to be sort of more important than all the black pawns combined because it's about to queen. And obviously there is a perpetual, but is there anything better? And I'm pretty sure uh, either Sasha or Sopico live on air was suggesting that c4 must be winning. And indeed it is. It's a very beautiful win as well. e7, c takes d3, e8 queen. And here you play queen b3 check, this little bit of a check. And the king cannot go to d2 because this is mate in 2. And if the queen goes to any other square, let's say king c1, you have d3, d2, discover, check. And then you pick up on f3. And you end up with a position which you don't even need to really discuss because black has like four pawns for the exchange, two of which, two of which will just queen on, <laughs> on the king side. There's just nothing, nothing left to play here. But the move Magnus made, bishop e5, is not really uh, a problem either. King c2 because Fabi really uh, only has those moves to make, and here uh, you can make probably an argument even for for rook g3 here. But uh, considering the fact that Magnus seemed reluctant to make the move rook g3, something like b6, b5 is just utterly winning for black, because once again, white is completely tied up, and the idea of playing b5, b4, opening, opening up control over the d4 square, will just collapse, uh, collapse white's position uh, entirely. 
and after let's say a3 you can finally maybe realize the uh, overarching idea and and go for this and here queen a1 wins but bishop takes c3 with the idea of playing queen c1 check and then b4 check is an even faster uh, is an even faster victory for black uh, the machine says once again you may not want to calculate those variations but they shouldn't be impossible to calculate either <clears throat> Magnus played queen g7 instead, uh, attacking the pawn on c3, but also giving uh, giving the white knight liberty to leave the, the f1 square. And this is move 40. Fabian made move 40 with uh, seconds on the clock. I think the, this entire sequence he was playing more or less on increment. But Magnus, I'm pretty sure, had a couple of minutes here. And the fact that he did not play queen g1 here is well, very difficult to fathom for me. Of, uh, because uh, I mean the variation knight g4 queen a1 knight takes e5 rook g1 is not really very difficult to to assess it's quite clear that white just gets mated therefore after queen g1 you uh, well queen a1 is just a winning threat so you have to go back to f1 and now this is move 41 you get additional 50 minutes uh, to uh, assess everything properly and you can play b5, you can play rook g3, you can play whatever you like pretty much in this position because you will, uh, when the time trouble is over, you will come down and you will solve this. It's not really a very difficult puzzle for uh, any strong player, let alone a player of uh, Magnus's caliber. But uh, after knight h2, Magnus ended up playing move 40, bishop takes c3, after which the game objectively probably is just a draw. And it's really very striking that this happened because uh, it's not very often that you see that you see Magnus uh, throw away uh, a victory where basically he was in complete control for the majority of the uh, the game leading to a uh, move 40 and had a number of forced wins um, and to just uh, give it away like this is, is, is very unusual I think for him. Queen takes a four now the threat is obviously queen f7 check and another positional threat is that you can play knight g4 and uh, white suddenly uh, is uh, very much in control on, on the king side uh, controlling the uh, the open f file locking down the open g file with the knight and even the e pawn will start running so it's just an unclear position if you allow that so black plays uh, bishop d4 and here uh, Fabi uh, thought for a very long time because he needed to calculate everything precisely and he did and he played queen f7 check uh, king a6 queen g7 rook g7 uh, rook e2 rook g3 and knight f1 is playable here but uh, the move Fabi made I, I think we have to agree is probably the cleaner uh, the cleaner draw of the two he played knight g4 one thing you shouldn't do is play e5 here immediately because bishop takes e5, rook e5, rook g2 would just finish the game on the spot. But after knight g4, we were expecting originally for black to play king b7, but uh, as a matter of fact, after e5, uh, king c7, e6, king d8, there is this move knight h6, uh, creating the idea of e7 and knight f5. Black has to play rook f3, rook e4, bishop g7, and here the computer says rook takes h4 is a draw, but also, I think more humanly, something like knight f7, check king e7, and knight d6 is a draw, uh, creating ideas of all these perpetuals via the c8, d6 squares. White is just not uh, not worse here. So Magnus took on h3, e5, rook f3, e6, rook f8, e7, rook e8, knight h6, h3, knight f5, and this position is a reasonably uh, straightforward technical draw, although white still needs to take one or, one or two correct decisions. Uh, bishop f6 played, and here uh, Fabi played a3. Uh, quite understandably, he is not really uh, uh, in love with the idea of defending uh, this rook ending with the king cut off on the first. We spent some time during the live broadcast trying to figure out if this is a draw or a win. We did not come to any uh, obvious conclusion, but you would be insane, I think, to go for this with white if you have any choice whatsoever. So uh, starting with a3 makes a lot of sense. And uh, uh, Magnus played b5 here, which is uh, maybe not the most pressing move he could have tried. He could have played king a5, trying to stop what Fabi has done in the game, but it's probably still a draw after rook h2, 
takes, 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 rook, ace, uh, rook h3, because the king can now come to c3, and uh, uh, white uh, probably holds this. Uh, but after the move b5 that Magnus played, uh, uh, 5e correctly played b4, takes, takes, and now black more or less is obliged uh, to play bishop takes e7, because he's kind of run out of uh, useful uh, useful ideas, and he cannot even play king b6 because of the fork on c8. Uh, so bishop takes e7, knight takes h2, rook h2, rook takes e7, and this is move 55, and the game ended on the move 115. I will not be showing you those 60 moves. Uh, there is one critical position which kind of needs discussing, but let's talk about this endgame in general. It's quite obvious that the endgame should be drawn, but uh, Black is looking for a5 and in particular c5 breaks, and if he somehow manages to play c5 and trade the c6 pawn for the b4 pawn, um, sorry, uh, then he will be winning. But that, of course, will never be allowed by white. But if he pushes a7, a5, this endgame with the pawn on d3 against the c and b pawns, it's a draw, but it might require some precision, uh, in particular if you consider the time situation, which I think when this endgame started, Fabi had like 15 minutes against oodles of time for Magnus. And Magnus's plan, uh, I think, is quite fair uh, to describe as wait as long as possible without allowing any simplifications or immediate draws, to play a5 only when Fabi has very, very little time available. And he was doing a reasonably good job of, uh, of it uh, for a while, and on move uh, 79, this is the uh, the position that appeared on the board. And Magnus could play uh, something like rook d3 here, to which uh, Fabi replies by, uh, let's say, rook h4. We play king b6, king c2, we play let's say rook a3, um, or even earlier actually. Uh, here I think we can still go back, but we can, uh, if you look at the position uh, on move uh, 78, already here uh, after, after rook h8, you can play a5 here, uh, b8 and just take on a5. And uh, white has no immediate draw because rook h7, king b6, rook h6, you can play rook a3, check. And after king c2, uh, now you uh, divert the king via d6, d5, throw. so there's never any perpetual uh, uh, check. A combination of check and attacking the c6 pawn doesn't work for white. And then you play this structure for a while. But uh, Fabi still had maybe 8 minutes left here. And Magnus chose uh, not to do any of that, and he played rook a3 check, king, C, king b2, rook g3, king c2, rook g5, and uh, then tried uh, to burn some more of Fabi's time and go back to the situation where he could play H, uh, a5. But it never actually materialized. He got pretty close, and this is the position after 101 moves, uh, rook f7 and king d6. But unfortunately for him, uh, here Fabi spotted an immediate draw by playing rook a7, king d5, and king b2. And after rook a4, king c3, there's just no way to make progress. So Magnus played rook d3, takes and takes. But here after king b3, uh, uh, basically, uh, as long as black has a threat of uh, giving uh, a check on the third and then playing king c4, the rook should stay on a6 or a6 and b6 to keep an eye on the c6 pawn. And as long as this very easy rule is observed, the, the position is completely drawn. So they played even this position for an additional 10 moves, but uh, here I think uh, there was uh, no longer uh, any semblance of doubt that the game will end in a draw, and uh, end in a draw it did on move 115. So uh, this, is my, this is my very lengthy, I suspect. I can't see the timing, but I apologize that once again I couldn't stop myself from talking my recap of game one, which was uh, a very dramatic game and a game of an obvious tremendous uh, missed opportunity for Magnus, who was uh, in control for most of it and just completely winning for a long stretch of time between, let's say, moves 34 and 40. Uh, move 40 being, I think, the decisive mistake of the game, uh, letting sleep uh, what felt like a a very, very convincing and a very well-played victory as well, eh? because uh, what Magnus showed uh, coming out of the opening and sort of uh, the, the passage of play between moves 15 and 35, I think, was very, very impressive by 
uh, by Magnus, and we uh, we thought he played uh, exceptionally well to get there, and then he just let it all let it all go by a, a series of very uncharacteristic uh, mistakes and uh, sort of indecisive uh, indecisive choices. Uh, today is the day of game three, so we uh, could see. Uh, more discussion uh, on the same topic opening wise or not it's very difficult to tell but be sure to tune in uh, coverage uh, starts as usual uh, 4 p.m. Central European time uh, 3 p.m. London time uh, and uh, uh, Sopico and uh, and I uh, with uh, Alexander Grishuk on Skype will be uh, covering uh, every moment of uh, the match Thanks for watching. This has been Peter Swidler with, uh, for Chess24 with the uh, highlight video for Game 1 of the World Championship match.